right. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it did occur to me before I started that, hey, when I show this video, you'll be able to see my son's manga collection and plush toys. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's going to be professional. I'm so, but I thought to myself, wait a minute. Here I'm about to talk about games and play for the next two hours. And I too much of a coward to have gaming pop culture in the room behind me. So I said, no, we're going to show it. Well, I, but I will put on a coat for this. So yes, I am Dr. James Pigeon Fielder, a retired, retired Lieutenant Colonel from the United States Air Force, currently teaching in the Department of Political Science at Colorado uh, State University. And you, how well can you, everyone hear me? Yeah, I think that's a little bit better there. I just had to move a little closer. Oh, okay, sweet. All right, all right, no worries. All right, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. And what I'll be talking about, good, uh, oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I look at my own CV though and go, who is this guy? He's actually qualified to do something. But I'll talk more about myself shortly, lead up to my research and how it aligns with today's talk. This is what I'll be talking about today, starting with a little bit of myself and talking about, when I say psychology of gameplay, it'll be uh, you know, the ritual, culture, social, the symbols, um, fun, and uh, how it aligns to wargaming uh, towards the end. So with that, who am I? The Pigeon. I'll talk about my uh, nickname momentarily. But yes, 25 year military career, uh, combined Army and Air Force, uh, Persian Farsi linguist, electronic warfare specialist in the Army, then Intel and six years in the Air Force Academy in the Air Force. Uh, now, um, as you can tell, I've, uh, I've adopted this Sicilian life very, very well. Although between you and me, I would sell my soul in the jar for a proper beard trim, but I'm too chicken to try to cut it myself because it's so curly, but I can wait. That's okay. So yes, uh, the first bullet here. Um, I want to be proven wrong. This might sound a little bit egotistical me, but as far as I know, as far as I know, I'm the only political scientist in the world who studies ludology as my primary focus. Like I call it political ludology, like studying emergent politics inside of game spaces and game worlds and seeing how people develop trust, social capital, and new political uh, communities inside these spaces. I've, I've designed games and studied games since 1997. I've built everything from small tabletop exercises with just a, a few uh, people. I will, I will lean forward. That's all good, uh, whatever it takes. It, I, everywhere to uh, running a, a game that had 5,000 participants, the entire city of Rapid City, South Dakota, and the 20th Bomb Wing. Is that better? Volume bar. Ah, good. Okay, sweet. And then recently selected for the first cohort of the Marine Corps University non-resident Krulak fellow, which is very exciting. Um, looking very much looking forward to that. Comes down to I've published games, I've educated on games. I, I. Oh, thanks, Diana. Woo! Extra credit. Uh, educate. I review for simulation and gaming. I do volunteer game mastering at a local games co-op, and I'm basically just a. Uh, professional geek and I love getting paid for it. So a little more than about what got me to the point I'm at. I'm following the, excuse me, following the Damien O'Connell school of talk about myself to make a point for the talk. And it started really in the 80s as a young uh, Gen Xer working with advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Like I just want to hold and hug a copy of the Fiend Folio you know, learning about theater of the mind at a very young age, back when it was a little frowned upon. And I did quite a bit of that. Plus, you know, the typical tabletop gaming of the time, like Monopoly, Risk, you know, cards, dominoes, uh, you know, things have uh, exploded since then, of course. But it really came down to that first fateful sergeant's time when I was a young specialist in the Army, and they said, Fielder, you don't seem to get stage fright, and you're kind of a pain in the butt. How would you like to build our next sergeant's time? I said, that sounds like a great idea. So I put together an exercise, starting with a tabletop and then actually going out into the, into the field to do some practice. And I didn't know at the time, but I was leveraging liminality and presence. I was, they said they had a lot of fun. It was realistic. It was tense. They did some learning and the learning was a primary focus. And you know, once you 
Oh, I saw that, Sean. Once you get that stink on you, and they said, well, we're going to have Fielder keep building these things. And I loved it. I sucked it up. I had a lot of fun doing it. I started building larger and larger exercises. Now, fast forward when I decided that mud for five years was okay, but mud for another 15 or 20, not so much. I'll just say uh, I don't regret being in the Army first, but I've never, never had a bad day in the Air Force like a bad day in the Army. Not even close. Then when I took over 28th Bomb Wing Chief of Intel Operations position, and I held it from 2003 to 2006, we, um, we were tasked, we were the shop tasked with basically building all the exercises, simulations, war games, and whatnot. And I got to apply you know, geopolitical analysis with everything I learned about game design up to that point. And this is the op where I had the opportunity to build a game for Rapid City and the 28th Bomb Wing. Now then fast forward to my first tour of the Air Force Academy. I should clarify, like smart enough to teach her, but way too dumb to have actually attended myself. We were talking about social capital in a class of American government. Talk using a classic text by Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy in America, then moving up to Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone. You know, but talking about you know trust, social capital, reciprocity. You know, how the American experiment worked in that we would learn to work together in local communities to get things done. And it depended on I scratch your back, you scratch mine, and we've learned to trust each other. Well, when you know a student stood up, and what I feel bad about to this day is I can remember what he looks like, but I can't remember his name. He said, Captain Fielder, does social capital exist in game worlds? Like World of Warcraft, EVE Online. Actually, EVE Online didn't exist at the time. EverQuest, there's, there's a word. There's a and in grew so, true social scientist fashion, I looked at him and said, huh, I don't know, man, that's a good question. Let me go look it up. Before you know it, I'd written a paper on studying democratic effects inside of virtual worlds, presented it in the Western Political Science Association, and that writing sample got me into a PhD program at the University of Iowa. So now I've been largely studying trust, but also are very interested in the study in the game environments. And I still had that stink on me, building games at the Air Force Academy. I uh, moved over to the 25th Air Force and designed their big 25th Air Force logistics war game while I was there. And then my penultimate event, penultimate? It's probably not the right word. A cool thing I did on my second tour of the Air Force Academy is it turned out they needed someone to teach their war game design course there. And I was the only person on the faculty qualified to do it. So I had a chance to teach the class there and it was a ton of fun they got to work with um, the uh, two national organizations built two real games to test the processes and where does that leave me now to current projects now that i'm now a civilian savage at color state ranging in a variety of completion starting with vampire the masquerade that should be in print now that'll be a ch chapter in the forthcoming book the politics of horror where I studied emergent politics in two local groups. Uh, to Ghost of the Titanomachy, I just need about two days worth of work on that. I can send it to Games and Culture or Simulation and Gaming. We're working with Sean and some other folks on the let's see, bottom left, Role for Political Initiative. I was supposed to put, uh, present that in Chicago this spring, but then COVID hit. I'm just, again, studying emergent politics uh, agency inside of two local groups. Uh, next week, I'm uh, presenting three classroom game design courses at Origins Online, which should be a lot of fun. And book I just put in a book proposal with Harvey and Gibb on political science gaming. And then a fun one, I also taught a class at the Air Force Academy on studying the politics of fantasy and science fiction worlds called Politics and Worlds That Never Were. I have a photo in this shortly. And I'm putting together a podcast for that and an edited volume. Uh, working with Andrew Lutz at University of Pittsburgh and Darren Jackson at the Air Force Academy. If anyone's interested in contributing to that, I'd be much obliged. So, what do I do for fun then? So it's a mixture of like what I wanted when I retired. That I just want a big gaming table where I can have multiple projects and games going simultaneously. Uh, running games at Genghis Khan. There's my son over there holding up the, the, his fingers. I'm uh, still interested in studying, also studying emergent politics in fantasy and sci-fi environments. Uh, I could do a whole other talk on that. I'll, I'll table that for now. And here's how I got the nickname, he, uh, Pigeon. This guy right here, he's anywhere from 24 to 37 years old. He's roosting upstairs right now. Had a big barbecue at my house. 
the whole unit was there, and they looked at me, and they looked at the birds, and they looked at me, and they looked back, and they said, hey, Builder's like a big old pigeon himself. Woo! And now here you are. Now everybody knows me by pigeon. I'm kind of a big, goofy bird, so I'm cool. Uh, I'm cool with sticking with the name. And down here on the, the far left, you're like, music, what does it have to do with the day? Uh, I got a funny story for us. Yes. So about the, the last four years, I've been studying on my own electronic music. Combination of a semi-modular synthesizer, synthesizers outside of the box. And then in the box, a virtual synthesizer such as VCD rack, soft tube, and voltage modular. Basically, it has buttons, wires, and sliders. I want to play with it. And that's the key term, playing with it. My wife has said, man, I've never seen you get so fascinated by a hobby as I have watching you messing around with all this gear. And I don't even, I don't know how to play the piano. I can sort of read music. But, and, but I leverage off of my time as electronic warfare in the Army. I've learned how to manipulate sound just like using oscillators and fil filters and whatnot. And it occurred to me just a few weeks ago before giving this talk, it's because it's like playing a game. Here's my analogy, pun intended. Analog, analogy, get it? Okay, you're not laughing. Anyway, so in a game, I could take a um, basic plain piece of paper, you know, with nothing on it, no symbols, no objectives, and you can write on it, scribble it, but now I put a hex map on it. Okay, now it's, if you're familiar with that, and you think, oh, it's to measure something for movement. Now I put some art on it. I put a few, will look like bridges, will look like trees. And now I've taken these constraints, limited map, taking these symbols, and if I overlay some objectives on this map, I've created a game. I've created this space where people can gather around, players can gather around, start manipulating this game world, and make decisions that once they've crossed into this game world actually matter. And the same can be said about then the music. It occurred to me, it's like a hex map, kind of not shaped like hexes, but I take these symbols, constrain them, i.e. just I build a symbol rack with an objective, get the audio to the audio out, and it becomes a puzzle, an infinite puzzle, because I, I have a thousand of these things, so I, I could spend the rest of my life doing nothing but configuring these things. It's always a challenge. I'm always learning new things. And I was like, what does it take to get to the objective? And once I cross into the space where, I, like a toy, I want to reach in, I want to grab these knobs and pull these wires, it brings me into a magic circle, which I'll be talking about shortly. All right. So that's what gets us then to why do games matter? How do they affect us at the mental level, at the psychological level? Now, I gave a shorter version of this at Moore's a few, uh, back in March. This might seem familiar to some people, but I've added a little bit more theoretical detail to this portion. Why games work? It leverages off of the concepts of liminality, the magic circle, uh, Dr. Perla's synthetic experiences, and in virtual reality presence. All this means is that it, when you play a game, it's you're crossing a, a, into a threshold where inside this game environment, the game now becomes your new reality. All these rules that se might seem just bizarre to someone viewing outside, like why would you only hit the ball with your chest? Or why would you only move the knight a certain way on a chessboard. It's because once you're inside, it's those rules create your, your um, mental experiences. They, this is what Huizinga called the magic circle. And I, you know, I, I probably have his, Huizinga's Homo Ludens dogged up like an old country preacher. And then Peter Perla would say this, if I uh, read his uh, work correctly, or of gaming, similar idea that when you come to play a war game if designed correctly it creates a synthetic experience for the players that while they're playing it becomes visceral it becomes real so someone outside of the circle is going to see this game and go they're just moving pieces of paper across a map until you start playing and you start feeling like i'm actually losing people or i'm actually killing someone else or i'm actually seizing this objective or i'm cooperating with one team to overcome another 
And then finally, the presence idea, that specifically comes from virtual reality. That's when someone plays Second Life, um, World of Warcraft, EVE Online, where as long as they can identify themselves in some way on the screen, they actually project their identity inside of the game. And then as far as they're concerned, they now exist inside of the game. So this is both literal and figurative. This is literally, when you cross the magic circle, this is you look at a football field. Now that, fi that football field is consecrated, that soccer pitch is consecrated, that chessboard is consecrated. You know the exact dimensions, you know what the pieces are, and if you know how to play the game, of just the act of walking across the field or putting your hand on the board is creating that ritual moment, that rite of passage, that liminal state. And the mental aspect, the weightlifter chalking their hands or the D&D player picking up the dice and throwing them, the tactile moment is very important. They've handled the dice it kind of makes their mind receptive to, I am stepping into this new reality. And for the next few hours, and those hours can actually disappear very quickly. This is, this is reality and everything else doesn't matter. When you're inside this liminal state, everything you face is real. Everything, the emotions you feel is real. Every uh, objective you overcome is real. When you face a fear in a liminal state, it creates courage that actually that actually carries out into the world outside. So if someone is something as simple as I'm afraid of spiders, well now you're fighting one on a tabletop or in a virtual system. It's not real, it's not gonna hurt you, but it's you challenging your fears and overcoming it. Um, plenty of evidence uh, from, I, I can show you the, the references list at the end saying that when people learn leadership, courage, agency inside a game environment that they come out and they say it made me more confident in applying for jobs it made me more confident in applying decision making in a strategic moment or I saw something like this in a game now I'm actually seeing it happen in real life I might know what to do or how to handle myself and if I don't at least I have confidence and from a wargaming perspective be it uh, for entertainment purposes or strategic decision making you're still, you're putting players in a room where they have to learn to, you know, this, okay, it's a board. The hex map isn't a perfect descriptor of, um, of uh, distances or whatnot. But while they're there, like, we're working together to overcome this objective. And it creates real cohesion. In a way, that's why uh, military basic tra training works well. Okay, that goes in a lot more visceral fidelity than say a tabletop board game does, but the risk isn't real, but the learning is, is that it comes down to the same thing. Or finishing off with Huizinga's quote that when it comes to games in this type of sacred space, the temple and the tennis court are indistinguishable from another. Um, oh yes, uh, Dr. Uh, Downs Martin, I will have that at the very end. I will have both a, a short list here and I also have a larger like a 10 page document where I have all sorts of sources um, backing this up all right so then so that's uh, you know putting you into the right mental state now how about as a building culture or teaching culture the games have also been very historically important about how they train humans to become social members of society that we in a way were could be hardwired for narrative for story and for this type of structure, where actually my colleague uh, wrote in his uh, role-playing um, fantasy role-player role-playing games Bible, saying that with the act of playing is the act of your your teaching uh, cultural effects to the players. So modern times, a modern role-playing game could be talk, talking about you know modern her heroic agency, uh, modern issues. But if you go back to even historic games that there'll be a sport could be training the warriors for battle or a game like chess could be teaching their royalty to learn to think strategically. This, for me at least, it's more than just the simple act of moving pieces on a paper, but this is a game. is also like a story creates a narrative. It builds agency for the players 
and it follows uh, Joseph Campbell's heroic uh, structure from the hero with a thousand faces. And that's uh, here's an example of uh, from Prowlers and Paragons by Evil Beagle Games, uh, playing uh, lower ranking superheroes trying to overcome an objective at a gas station. And that's this would be me facing uh, right here across the table. For someone looking outside, again, it's just a map with some pieces on it and a dinosaur, because who doesn't like dinosaurs? But for us playing it, we generated our own narrative, trying to work together again to overcome an objective. And done right, players will talk about these moments, these narratives, and these story structures for d years afterwards, maybe even decades. And since I promised um, Sebastian, I mentioned the dinosaur, if I recall correctly, in the game at this gas station, there was a cement dinosaur that was like holding up the sign of the gas station. And we, as the players, we said, why just talk about it? Let's get a real dinosaur. And Sean was like, oh, I've got one right there. So we put a dinosaur. And similar to a Chekhov's gun, like, why would you have a dinosaur on the board and then not use it? So we made sure a villain animated it. So now we have this fighting cement dinosaur on the board, which was a ton of fun. Ton of fun. Um, whoo! All these questions flying past. Oh, I should, I should, I should mention. I talked to Sebastian before that I thought the narrative would be a little more coherent, assuming I'm coherent at all, as if I presented the briefing in one go, and then I'll get to the questions at the end. So that would leave me the last idea here from a modern thinker uh, in Bogost at the Georgia Institute of Technology talking about from gaming the concept of procedural rhetoric. Now he's referring more to video games, but I'm overlaying this to large, games writ large, that the act of playing, the act of learning to work inside of these rules and understand the structures of the game means that the players are writing the world themselves inside of it. And that's how you can start seeing now these emergent structures developing amongst the players inside the game and how they carry it out of them. Right. Sticking along with that argument, the idea of games as social uh, teachers, I'm going to go back to the importance of tactile, but it's more than that. When it comes to learning, games, you have games that appeal to all the senses. Touch, taste, smell, hearing, sixth sense, I don't know. And you say taste? I mean, that's like if I was on a military exercise and just the, the, the like the taste of gunpowder or something, or the, the smell of the CLP oil, that's enough to like trigger a memory or trigger a, a thought or make someone realize they, they put this sensory concept and associate it with what they should be doing and makes the training or the their um, performance automatic. So if you're going to use the game as a social teacher, particularly a, you know, using a war game as a training device or an education device, you bring, back, bring out as many facets as you can, like make it as, sen as sensual as possible to engage with players. Games are also about projecting and confronting the self. Um, again, for someone outside of the game, that might seem like a silly concept. But at least from like video games and um, role-playing games, you know, players will project portions of their identity inside of these game worlds or these game scenarios. Even if they're trying to play a completely different character or play a different type of identity or experiment with different uh, narratives, a part of themselves will be inside of that. And part of them also is going to confront what they believe in. Like by, by playing a different character, like I would consider myself a good lawful character, but a lot if I play evil and I have to make face a moral challenge inside of the game. Well, how does that change me when I actually carry it out in game and carry it out with me? Going all the way back to 1983, Gary Fine's um, shared fantasy, he would argue yes. Like you're gonna, you make these decisions that stick with you. And um, actually I can think of an example I can think of an example. The um, there is a in 
an early D and D module. If someone can remember exactly when it is, uh, players actually come across a situation where they have the choice to kill twenty baby orcs, and there are actually players who struggled ethically and morally with that. You know, it's just a game, but now they're actually playing it. They've merged in some way with their characters, and they have they are actually shaking, thinking about it. And if they actually do it, they feel real guilt or real shame as a person when they walk out of the game doing it. Also, finally, pulling off a Dr. Rex Brynan as a social teacher, from a social teacher aspect, games also then help build networks of familiarity. This is the, some people who will, you know, go to a con, game convention, and they might see another friend of theirs. They only see them once a year or twice a year at these conventions. But they will treat them more like family members than people they run into every day at the office. Because when they know when they go to this gaming environment, they're going to engage in this new shared reality for several days. And then as when people like play war games together regularly, Going back to the social capital, it builds trust, it builds reciprocity, it builds familiarity. So now in addition to coming to the gaming table, they'll also be likely to you know, build stronger or weaker ties with each other and be willing to call, say, I need help with something in real life. Can you help me? Yes. And if done right again, because of that liminal state, they likely will have built greater trust with each other because of a sense of taking shared risk with each other inside of the game world, even if the risk carried no actual personal threat to themselves. So when you have these games that you can apply yourself, you can build knowledge, demonstrate your knowledge, demonstrate your skills, display courage, feats of strength by yourself. Okay, that's fun with others. That's great because now you're learning from each other and building trust with one each other and demonstrating real, what's perceived as actually real skill and real might inside of the game. And then it carries over with how you interact with each other personally after the event. All right. The next layer then is the symbols aspect, uh, symbolic correspondence, where coming from rituals, this would be uh, think of a you know pre-modern society where they might a, a, a um, elder might wear the mask of a creature or a skull during a ritual, sticking to the magic circle or the synthetic experience. It wasn't just an act, a religious act of putting on a mask. When they put it on, they became the persona. They became the cougar. They became the lion. Uh, if in a stage play, the actor becomes the mask of the person they're playing. And fast forward again to now, where someone is saying, that's silly, that's, that's primitive. Well, how about the act of putting on a sports jersey? Or when you put on a bike helmet? Or going to a game convention? And you're dressing, you know, engaging in costumes or cosplay and embodying that persona. Or, someone asked me this question a week ago, fair enough. When I was in the military, the act of putting on my uniform, all the symbols that came with it, what I, I embodied the persona of what that uniform meant. So, leveraging off of then Roger Kawa's work, he argued, and I'm inclined to agree with him, was that you could align all games then into one of four categories with two different rule types. They call this, this was the, you know, the, the conduits through which cultures endure. You know, and think about like all, like everything we've talked about up to this point, the symbols, the objectives, the constraints, the embodiment. So it could be a game of skill, a gone, game of chance, a Leia, Pretend, mimicry, or sensory overload, elinx, like going in a swing set or a whirling dervish or whatnot. Followed by the level of rules. Pedia is something you'd be more likely to see amongst younger children 
where they don't have a sense of constraint, where their games don't have rules or they make up rules on the spot and it's considered free play. The world of adults, you might see more governed by ludus. Like when we sit down to play this professional war game, it's gonna be governed by rules. Either way though, the space is, becomes, is the same if done right. It is still a ritual space. It is still a magic circle inside which the child engaged in free play is now in a complete world of make believe. And the professional, the major and the master sergeant who are trying to achieve an objective, it's tense. It's not maybe not quite as fun as free play as a child, but it still gives them that sense of, of purpose and of being in an altered sense of reality. Altogether, put together some symbolic correspondence with the types of games and the magic circle. I can take a deck of cards. Odds are anywhere in the world we might not speak the same language. We might not have the same uh, faith, have completely different social, uh, cultural virtues and mores, but they'll know what this is. And we might be able to play a game together. And the act of playing that game together will be enough to help build some sort of rapport through which we can communicate. And it gives us a means to communicate. Or um, stories of uh, early days of the Second Iraq War where you want to get to know the locals, toss a soccer ball on the field, play, engage in the uh, game of skill, Logan. engage in, a, in strength, demonstrate your skill and build rapport. You don't have to speak, maybe you don't speak English, maybe you don't speak Arabic, but you know what the soccer rules are. You might not even call it soccer, you call it football. Or hold up a dice or a domino in front of somebody. Ultimately, these are universal alphabets that we can share and use to help cross over into liminal states together and overcome risks and build trust. Now, applying this to both fun and learning, because thinking about the Georgetown University Wargaming Society, I'm thinking in terms of both, we want to play for entertainment but we also want to have a learning outcome and think about this in a professional way, i.e. if I sit down to play a distant plane, what am I taking from it? It's more than just the act of playing the game, but also lessons from history and lessons of like how I might overcome a low intensity conflict challenge. So this is where I draw off of Raf Koster, who wrote The Theory of Fun, off the top of my head, published in 2004. And his take, and I hug myself when mention this because it makes perfect sense is that what is fun fun is learning fun is that moment when the brain is being challenged by something novel and new it, fun doesn't have to be all smiling and happy though fun could be me being frustrated playing those new modular synthesizers F uh, fun could be someone who's playing dark souls for the first time and is getting pasted by the enemy over and over again and they're actually getting angry and frustrated but then they learn to play through it and their brain has an aha moment and they've, oh, I've overcome the challenge. I've learned something new. Now I can move forward and have more confidence in myself. Transform that to professional wargaming, um, <clears throat> to pat Sebastian Bay on the back, say, let them compete. Let the players you know, in this wargame environment enter this circle and learn to work together to overcome these challenges, which can actually be very stressful, but done right, it is still fun. It is still something that if they will remember days, weeks, months, years after the fact, and what they learn in that room could actually help them on the combat field as well. Also, when play is done right, it can help get people into the flow state. Now, here I go, I practiced before I came on, Gentleman uh, named Sheik Sheik Mentzahai. Now it's going to be on YouTube for everyone to see if I said that wrong. Uh, came up with the idea, a proposed theory in 1975, and he still writes on it. Um, said if you could apply this to a game environment, a work environment, a creative environment, saying if if you're in a meaningful moment where you're sort of being, 
You're being challenged, but not too much and not too easy. You enter this state where who here hasn't written a paper or worked on some sort of creative project where time just evaporated on them? And they felt like they were completely in tune with their tools, in tune with the environment around them. This would tie into just actually talking to my, ah, thanks, James, talking um, to my friend, um, Sean, here. He said, how many people, have, they come to a game, oh, we're going to be playing for 10 hours today. And like, oh, my goodness, I don't have 10 hours to play. And they sit down, they blink. And that 10 hours is gone and they don't want to leave. Or they spend an entire weekend at a convention. And three days or four days becomes this altered reality where time shifts, their senses shift, and they desperately don't want to leave on Sunday because they want to hold on to that, like almost an extended flow state that's lasted multiple days. Also, good game taps in ideally into intrinsic motivation, i.e. the player is sitting down because they have an interest in the topic and they're willing to do it without profit. Like I'm willing to, I want to play Persian Incursion or I want to play um, Stuffed Fables because it appeals to me uh, viscerally inside. It's something I'm willing to do for free. So from a learning aspect, now let's say that you sit down with uh, military war gamers. Let's say, let, let's say the Marine uh, War College. It is our Marine? Yes, Marine Corps University. I'll say Marine Corps War University. You get to have some majors playing because they've already dedicated themselves to learning the art of strategy. So they have some intrinsic motivation in doing it right they're going to be more likely to go into this flow state and have that meaningful play and have that learning outcome. Versus extrinsic motivation, that's someone who doesn't want to be there. Someone who does not have interest in it. Uh, they're learning because they're being paid to do it or being, they're being threatened to do it. Those would be the players who um, you'll have difficulty bringing into the magic circle. The naysayers, the critics, um, the uh, players who um, how should I say? If we want to expand on professional wargaming, we have to like in, to have to kind of break that, like have them encourage, make them realize, no, this is about learning a topic that's actually valuable to your own personal interests. Ultimately, you know, I say the best games exist at the limits of the player experience at the bottom. Like, don't make it too hard. Don't make it too easy. But whatever type of game it is, you want to have fun, however you define fun, it has to have an objective. Entertainment game, objective. Learning game, objective. Professional game, objective. I, what is the goal? What are you trying to achieve? It's particularly important in education games, and I'd say professional games, because if you don't have a measurable objective that the players are trying to achieve, and it's not serving the, the uh, purpose of your organization or group, then you, does, you should question why you're playing in the first place. All right. Now, also going back to when I said uh, at the very beginning, I was, when I had the modulars up and the, the analogy map up, I talked about constraints. But multiple times I've alluded to constraints, how you know, a good game requires rules, boundaries. Like the magic circle can be in your head, but it can also be physically drawn on the, on the ground. If you really want to in, get the, into the psychology of gaming, whatever game the player engages in, yes, it meets, it's not too hard, not too easy, but it must have consequences. If, they're, if it's going to be memorable, if they're going to stay, if they're going to suspend their disbelief for the entire time, if they're going to engage in that role-playing game for 10 hours, then they have to feel like the risks they are taking are real inside this game space. That their 10th level fighter that they have been building for the last year through endless um, Prowlers and Paragons uh, Shine Tower campaigns can actually die in this game permanently. And so they have that sense of mourning and that sense of loss. Actually, I'll talk more about that in a second. It's that the consequences create conflict and the conflict creates a narrative and the narrative creates the learning which sticks with the players.
Now, you don't necessarily want to wait till the very end to have this one big payoff, i.e. we're gonna play for a year to kill the big foozle at the end, to get the treasure, even though all that treasure might destroy the local economy, but that's a whole different story. You build up with small rewards that, okay, I'm, I'm trying to overcome uncertainty, I'm trying to work around the boundaries of this game, I'm trying to work with risk. Hey, but I made a single level, or I got this cool new sword, or in the professional war game, I've advanced my forces to this point of the map for the next game, day's play. And that'll encourage, that'll tap into the, the, the uh, intrinsic motivation, tap into the theory of fun, but through building that positive feedback, that feedback loop. Like I just want to keep playing now because I can see myself facing these this uncertainty and succeeding with small setbacks, but I'm still, overall, I'm succeeding. I guess this is where now I can tell, given a, a, a very sad example of consequences, but very emotionally powerful and very narratively powerful. Reading uh, recently, probably in the last year, about a game that lasted, it was a role-playing game that lasted about 10 years. It was a very, very long campaign. The, the people involved had been playing together for a long time, and they had watched their characters develop. And so weekly, they're crossing to this ritual space to engage leaving and spending the rest of the week not only worried about their personal lives but wondering where what's going to happen to my character where's the story going the very end of the game the last battle they lost they failed they were all they were killed to total party kill remember they had been playing together this campaign for years and they failed like a real death in the family. The dungeon master looked him in the eye and said, what do you want to do? And he said, let's talk for a moment. So the dungeon master left, let the players come back and talk. He comes back and the players, through tears, said we are going to live with the consequences of this outcome. Because we failed because of it. what, we came in with a bad strategy and we failed. Now talk about a powerful emotional moment because now it's no longer a game. They have just lost basically, again, family members that they, that they are cultivating. And I think if they're gonna repair that strategy the next time they play, you're damn right they're gonna remember what they did wrong after they do the after action report on their own game at that moment. Now, let me, let me finish that on a positive note. Also with plenty of examples of um, Oh, actually, I do have one. My my co my friend and colleague Mike Serbrook could actually describe it better than I can. I'm not sure if he could be here this evening, but he just play, finished an extended uh, Prowlers and Paragons game called Well the Worlds that he designed, and they had been playing together for about two years, and apparently their their final battle, where they brought in all their skills, all their strategy. Remember, go back to like the knowledge, skills, strength application to bear yes there's risk involved there's uncertainty but they had learned how to work together as a team and overcome these challenges and the moment they won it was a culmination of two years inside this magic circle off and on to win this objective where now they're instead of tears of of depression from the first group it's tears of joy just going we did it we did it as a team as a family and look at our characters now you know hugging and back slapping after that uh, yes, thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, Mike's awesome. Um, so now to to um, finish here. Okay, that's certainly a lot of stress to get to the very end to uh, to lose. But if I was going to do and make it build up on the uncertainty and risk inside of a local game, like I'm playing, like let's say a two day game with my class, or um, say the center naval analysis says we're going to do like a three-day game uh, with certain players to study this question so how do we what can we do to kind of ratchet up the tension a little bit make feel riskier and there's actually tools you can do that uh, so okay i can hand up i can handle a deck of cards okay now i'm in an environment mm, i like the smell of them too and so now a smell smell touch 
Oh, okay, constraints. We understand that. Well, they, they have limited information, so now they feel uncertain, the fog of war. They feel constrained because they might have limited movement. And here's the, you know, I, I actually hate it when this happens, but damn if it doesn't work, when you give a time limit. And you say, okay, you spent a lot of time thinking about this problem, but 10 minutes, there better be some action or somebody's going to be getting, getting killed here. Inside the magic circle, that time limit becomes, oh my goodness, we better get off our, get off our butts and actually do something about this. Or adjust the environment. That's always a fun one. Like, I literally make it a little colder in the room or a little hotter. Even I, or add a little humidity. Darker, like turn down the lights. Um, add some lighting effects, sound. Um, seeing the, the um, I'll put it this way. I've seen my fill of plain campaigns on YouTube of people sitting around a table versus ones that actually have music and lighting effects. Which one do you think is going to capture my imagination? The one that doesn't try to create a magic circle or the one that does? Okay, for the players in this first one, yes, it might. But for the outside observer, the changes in the environment draw me in. And the last one is a little, okay, this is the, I don't think I, you want to make your players hungry and thirsty. But yes, if you're going to build a realistic training environment, keep them up. You know, say, no, you're only going to sleep four hours tonight. Oh, you're only going to get one meal. Or, man, the water, water's hot, one, running low. I mean, I can think in my military training, the memorable events are the ones that were overcoming objectives Likely it wasn't going to die of fatigue or hunger, but I can sure remember overcoming his objectives while I was had only one hour of sleep in 36 hours. End result is, you really want to tap into the psychology of games? The players must feel achievement, and failure must have costs for it to feel like it matters to them. Then leads into, was this my second to last slide? I can't remember. The idea of the sacred and profane and then dividing the world in different spaces. Um, I added, I included this because when you, look, when you read the literature, the historical literature on game design, rituals, festivals, um, rites of passage, actually it's actually fairly recent that um, We have we built this wall between leisure and work. Probably the early 20th century. Uh, like Max Weber's Protestant work ethic. Um, somebody, if, if in the comments, would be willing to. I can't remember his name. I don't even know how to look it up. The gentleman who came up with uh, with early 20th century for um, studying work performance, like actually going into a factory and measuring how fast people worked and how much production they created. The, the, it's those sort of ideas that said, you know, we're in pre-modern societies or even pre-industrial revolution societies. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Um, where there was, li there was little divide between the public space, private space, or public ritual, private ritual, regularly going to a religious service, regularly engaging in festivals, regularly engaging in play, where your entire life, in a way, was one long spiritual journey interrupted with work. Now, if I say, hey, I'm going to play a game in class today, the cynic will say, games, isn't that fun? Isn't that for children? Isn't that, again, primitive? Why would you waste your time playing Monopoly and Risk when you could be doing real work? And I would say, it's not just a game. This is something we need to bring back, I think, to society, is to realize the importance of games and gameplay. When I can go to my class here the last, this last fall, and they, they learn to apply concepts from comparative authoritarianism by playing a zombie apocalypse game, ironically called Virus 347, which was well before this uh, COVID kicked off, but, you know, getting the feedback afterward, they say, you know, we could have read about this material all day. You could test this on it. But the act of actually playing it, they said it reinforced the material. It made us feel like we were making decisions that matter, that we were actually going to lose 
by saying not just lose a game, but actually lose something, like part of us, like our society in this game is going to die. They're feeling that, yes, 50,000 people's lives were actually at stake. Here's another example from uh, Tom Allen's War Games from 1987, where he interviewed some uh, d players doing a strategic nuclear war gaming in the uh, early to mid 80s. And they come into the game thinking, ah, oh, we're just going to sit around a table and talk about this. Well, you know what? By the end of three days, they were sh they had players having nightmares, players shaking, players like literally, they said, you need to go launch these nuclear weapons in a game and being afraid, like literally trying to put their finger on the button. They couldn't do it because that's how real it became to them. Like, it, what is the line that they said? It is hard to start a war because they felt the visceral response to it. Um, and I want to reiterate here then, drawing, and I could draw from multiple literature, so I could say Sean Fannin, Gary Fine, uh, James Lacey, that saying that, again, you do this right. I say to the cynic, how many people in this room, of course, I might be preaching the choir here, I don't know, but I want to evangelize where I can. Can't say, they can't remember playing a game from decades ago. And it's still as clear in their memory as it, as it just happened to them. And that the lessons they learn in those games carry over into their real life. Their confidence, their decision making, their trust, their personal relationships with people. So I'd say, no, it's not just a game. This is what we should have as part of a reality. Because games are ritual spaces in which play becomes real. And that real becomes can be carried out into our actual reality. So how does this, how can I apply this further to the Georgetown University Wargaming Society? The reminder that from my perspective and the literature, games and play matter to people. I mean, this is a matter of teaching us uh, socialization. It's about teaching us culture. It's about teaching us how to interact, teaching us how to face fears in a risk-free environment before we have to face that fear in real life. The lesson that if you're going to build a war game, professional entertainment, ensure that it's built it's then solidly from top down from a measurable objective. The players know what they're, they're trying to achieve and the referees know what they're trying to measure. And the, sticking to the flow state, the game should be solvable. I know there, there are, there, don't give me a, I, I, let me say there are people who purposely do want to play a game where they know the odds are stacked against them. Highly asymmetric. Just for that visceral, you know, like, let me see how long it can last. But you want the, the players should feel like they can win, but they can also lose and they can lose badly. And they're not going to recover. They're not going to, they're not going to pick up the howling ghost of 2002 Millennium Challenge and say, we'll just dust this off and start over. No, you have to figure out a solution. And ultimately, when you take all this, it can be huggable, like working together and to play Dungeons and Dragons or um, Descent or any uh, Everdell or any other games I have here. But in terms of professional gaming, this will give you the insight in a risk-free environment that peace and war are costly endeavors. And better to learn here than on the battlefield. With that, I have, this is just a small spanning of references. Um, these are all tied more directly to the slides here, but if you email me, and I have my email on the last slide, I, again, I have a 10 page document that actually has a checklist on how to build a game, tons of sources, a bunch of games that I recommend players play if they wanna learn like a number of different mechanics. And then I could, you know, any, any, uh, I feel comfortable that any type of assertion I made here, I can back up uh, with what I had there. And with that, whew, there we go. Oh, before I, I want to throw in a note. Throw in a note. I should have talked about this earlier. I don't know, know what I'm allowed to say, but I, uh, I do do some consulting on the side when it comes to wargaming, but I had a change of change of uh, vision and heart last week and now I'm in the initial initial stages of creating a nonprofit think tank dedicated to the study of games and gameplay like everything I just said here 
putting my money where my mouth is. Like real research on studying what are the ramifications of thousands of people playing together in a world like World of Warcraft. Or how can we study social problems and real human decision making uh, using game spaces or sports or whatnot. So that's been, if anyone has any ideas or wants to contribute to that cause, let me know. Don't worry, I'm not trying to sell you anything because that's bad for business. This is all for the good of the people. All right. Now I am open for questions, comments, concerns, thinly veiled threats, and any more. Hopefully, man, it would be terrible if no one could hear me this entire time. I'm hoping my volume is still okay. All right. What do we got here? Uh, well, so th thank you so much, Dr. Field. That was, that was great. And um, if it wouldn't cause absolute pandemonium, I'd unmute everyone and do a little applause, but uh, uh -huh. we'll, we'll just uh, imagine that everyone is, is cheering for you right now. Um, I, I just, I, so I have a couple questions lined up and I know um, Katie had asked at some point uh, if these slides could be made available. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, let me write a note to myself. I'll make them, it's pretty big as slides, so I'll, I'll, I'll bust them down to PDF to make the slides a little smaller. So all the slides will be posted on the Goose Google Drive. Um, and if you're signed up for a newsletter, the link should be at the bottom. So I'll get it from you, James, after the presentation. Or what, what Sebastian said. <laughs> yes. Woo. Um, okay, well, great. So I've, I've uh, got the, the first question uh, was from Stephen Downs Martin and uh, said, if a game encourages dishonesty in order to win, does it foster a lack of integrity in real life? I that was um, sarcastic or not, but answer. That's, I, um, I would argue, uh, yes. Um, now, the tying back to discussions about, you know, people um, like playing different moral choices, you will, I've seen evidence of people who go into a game, like I'm going to play a thief and I'm actually going to steal from my friends in this game. When it comes time to them actually do it, they said they find they actually can't do it. They like they purposely go in to perform dishonestly, and it violates them at a visceral level. Now, from, from a professional uh, wargaming standpoint, say if you're going to play dishonestly, one, you're not going to learn anything, and it, it, then it'll build distrust amongst the players. And uh, leading off of Kawa, Sutton Smith, and Huizinga, the idea of the spoil sport that once a player finds out another player is being non-trustworthy, it immediately breaks a magic circle. And now, you know, they not ever want to play with them again. And that lack of trust will carry over into also how they perceive them in real life. Like if you're gonna play like that, then why would I trust you in a real world in your interaction? Well, I think, um, okay, so Stephen just had a little note in the comments, um, not necessarily cheating, but games whose rules encourage a lack of integrity. I'll, I'll say that last part again. I'm sorry. Um, he had just clarified in the chat, uh, not necessarily cheating, but uh, games whose rules encourage a lack of integrity. Oh, the rules to encourage, yeah, I also, yeah, I would, I would, I would posit that a game that encourages the, you know, lack of integrity is going to challenge the players morally, and you'll actually, I'm, you'll have some that will buck against it. See, I can't do that. Okay, great. Um, next, we had uh, Stephen Lore. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Apologize if I'm not. Who had asked, uh, is there a difference between um, trust building efficacy in computer games versus board games or athletic games. Okay. Um, on, I would argue that it's um, easier to do in person, like at a sporting event or around the table. Um, because even though there is evidence that suggests that over time, yes, you can build trust in online games, it's still, the computer still builds a veil between the player and um, the UI and then the other player on the other end. Um, you know, with a, a, let's, say, let's use a sport as an example, since it's appeal, again, appeals to all the senses and you can physically interact with the people um, during the event, also getting in the spectators involved. Um, it just builds more, um, 
trying to think of the right word for this. I'll say in person, if you can, in person is always the best way for efficacy. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next, uh, we had Winter who had asked, uh, how is the liminal space changed by money being added to the equation? Um, talking about uh, like casino games and, and monetary bets on games that maybe aren't usually gambling. Oh, all right, disclosure, Winter is my twin brother. Damn it, he had to throw me the hard one. Um, Red Hat extraordinaire dude. The, um, when it comes to just rote gambling games, I haven't done much work on that, like studying like when people are playing blackjack for money or poker for money. It's interesting now that I think about it though. Uh, but from in the video game space, um, I have seen like the, um, like that crosses over into the sense of being liminal risk to real risk. Like, oh, oh my goodness, I'm actually gonna lose real money if I do this. But there's also evidence to show that if, if the limb, Good or bad, moral or not, if the liminal state is done right, once a person's identity is injected into like a video game, they'll be willing to fork over uh, money for loot crates, money for cash bets, because they want to engage more into this new reality they've stepped inside. Um, next, we have one from our very own Sebastian Bay who had asked, uh, how does alter egos and organizational culture play in the psychology of war games? Oh, alter egos and uh, organization. Certainly, you, if you have, like, if you're going to try to play a professional game inside of a company, organization, university, it helps to have the top-down support and already intrinsic buy-in to the process. If you're an organization that does not support gaming, that's going to be... You're gonna have a hard road against you trying to build up that type of rapport to build it. Um, can I, Sebastian, could you um, could you clarify more on the alter egos? So I guess the the question is two part. One is the alter ego in the sense that uh, many commercial gamers, especially in role playing games, have alter egos that they develop. Um, they're often not always direct reflections of their own values. Uh, like you talked about a little bit about the thief and other things. Um, and the second part of the question is sort of organizational culture of um, the, the military, for example, teaches their officers uh, to think a certain way to represent certain institutional values. Like the Air Force guy will obviously sort of go towards Air Force answers and how that sort of warps the psychology of games beyond the individual. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so from an alter ego perspective that do, that ties into the um, sense that you will see like if, if someone is a player is committed to playing a certain character in a game state and they start achieving objectives in that state aspects aspects of it will carry over into the real life interactions uh, usually it's positive it'll be like they'll feel more confident um, like if they play that thief and they're taking really tense risks, they might not be gonna think, okay, I'm a thief in real life, but they might be more willing to take some kind of risks. The pathology side of it though, is we have cases where um, players will develop unhealthy relationships inside of a game or unhealthy behaviors and evidence that they'll come out of it now and then start directing that unhealthy behavior in real life towards their friends and towards their family and even in the, in the workspace. That I, I would suggest it's not as common as the, the positive psychological outcomes, but it certainly does happen. Now in terms of um, going back to organizational structure, I'll put it this way. Like if I go into the, the briefing I just, I just gave, like I'm getting in more into about games and play. If I go into a Marine unit or an Army unit, maybe an Air Force unit and say, we're gonna play a war game. If they, you know, they know what a war game is, just the word carries certain imagery with it. Oh, they know, that sounds powerful. It sounds like our mission. Okay, it, yeah, it has the word game in it, but we know what it means. But if I come and say, we're gonna to play today, 
it might be meaning the same thing, but it's gonna that word is gonna carry likely negative baggage in that environment. So I actually had to I've had one thing I've actually struggled with in my civilian life and working with different types of organizations is the lexicon I choose to use. Like the word I use in this group is not gonna I can't use it in the next group because it will inspire different meanings with that group. Here I felt comfortable just putting it all on the table. Like we're gonna talk about the whole uh, the spectrum from child's play to professional gaming and it seemed to work. At least nobody's lit my Zoom on fire yet. <clears throat> okay, um, so I've got a, a, a question from, I believe it's Bill Haggard. Um, he said, uh, said this might be well outside the focus of the talk, which uh, he thought was great. So um, games can be psychologically, personally powerful, and in a generic or universal fashion can teach courage, uh, facing risk and social bonding, et cetera. Um, we said the, the crux for many designers and educators is, is shaping those powerful aspects of the magic circle to target specific learning objectives. Uh, so how do you take all of those quote unquote soft psychological experiences and provide hard evidence of objectives and a, a real world impact beyond just, an, beyond just anecdotes? Right. Um, so in a game context, I mean, I can measure some of that through like a pre-game survey on course material and then a post-game survey or, a, you know, or an exam on the material before and afterwards. Um, working with, do, doing my own uh, paper design, working on role for political initiative, the, um, a lot of it is in the qualitative research, like actually interviewing sitting down and interviewing players and trying to get a fairly good uh, demographic representation. A lot of them will be around the same age, but I can get, you know, a different demographics like eth ethnicity, um, sexual orientation, or whatnot. And basically ask some detailed questions about how does this affect you? Does it affect you? And better yet, can you provide concrete examples? Like how applying courage in this game actually re resulted in a certain outcome or you know drawing evidence from um, when I worked on that older paper on studying democratic effects in virtual worlds actually finding examples of people who said they were less inclined to vote for example before they started engaging in politics in the online world and they found now they were more encouraged to vote afterwards because they felt more uh, the act of playing in this political state helped kind of clarify their um, political ideologies, if you will. Yeah, that, I mean, that point about voting is interesting. And, I mean, I suppose now that you've explained it, it makes sense, but uh, it's kind of a cool cool point. Uh, sorry, I uh, just had no, this. No, don't worry, don't worry. Um, so we got a question from Diana Myers, uh, who asked, uh, how prevalent are games that change the rules in the middle of a game? She's curious as to how uh, uncertainty and change affects player dynamics. Um, God, rules changing in the game. I want to feel terrible because I want to say I'm, I'm struggling to imagine that. And I'm even thinking, I can't remember if it's uh, Dr. Perla or Jim Dunnigan who argued that you're, uh, at least in a professional game, the mechanics should remain recognizable throughout the duration. I don't change from strategic to operational and tactical in the same game space, because then you're not, you're just gonna confuse the player, it makes it harder to learn. Um, let's see, so I'm looking at, uh, okay, here's some examples, Flux. Um, ooh, so if I, uh, I, you know, James, I just got a copy of Fire in the Lake, I should go through that and look at it. All right, ooh, oh, Ryan, good one, I'm sorry, that's right, Legacy Games. Like the act, like you're literally destroying cards so they can't be used in the next playthrough, or physically marking out the board. Ah, so you're making me think a little bit larger about the question. My apologies. Okay, yes. So in this case, I will I will humbly and tearfully admit that in the audience is doing better job of answering it than I am. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, another one from Sebastian who had asked, um, 
Uh, could you speak about certain techniques and mechanics you have found really effective in creating the magic circle in professional board games? Oh, for when it, for me, it's like really being the in-person physical experience. Uh, you know, I've seen plenty of cool, you know, networked, computerized war games, you know, that can do, okay, they can do so much better data collection, number crunching, but anything you can do to make, like, get people start having that sensory experience, like the moment they walked in, like when I, for example, when I run a game in class, I make sure before the students don't show up that all the pieces are up and they can walk in and start handling them right away. That is very powerful. Um, it's anything where they can interact in person, you know, touch things, smell things, um, have a room that's dedicated to that game alone for the duration. So that in an ideal state, you've actually maybe decorated it in some way, like with maps, charts, and that any changes they make remain. Like they don't have a sense of, oh, at the end of the day, we've got to clean up instant magic circle killer they want to as soon as they walk in the next day you've done a hot wash everything's waiting for them ready to go that's all a fancy way of saying in purse in person and visceral is the way to go um i i, I actually had one of my own questions and we've got i think two more after that in the queue um but uh just in um could you talk a little bit about the difference in mindset that you try and create um, between kind of more adversarial, like zero sum games versus games that kind of emphasize your own strategy. Um, for the latter type of, I don't know if you've played the game Dominion at all, um, but where it's, you are playing against people and certain decks can be more adversarial, but a lot of it is kind of how you're building your own deck and kind of what, so, so I guess my question is what, uh, what kind of mindsets are you trying to create in both games um, and how might you structure it differently? Okay, so um, disclosure, as a personal individual, I, actually, I prefer cooperative games over competitive ones, like role-playing games or any of these games here that have like solo variants or cooperative variants, uh, such as uh, here on the uh, Bargain Quest. It's a competitive game, but you can buy a solo, cooperative deck for it so you can learn to play together. And also when I to design classroom games, yes, I need to create conflict conditions where the teams are gonna be actively opposing each other. But I found it's, uh, so far in my academic career, it's been more fruitful to have more cooperative elements so that teams learn to work together to overcome objectives. But if I was gonna do like um, two examples, like teaching comparative authoritarianism last fall or then teaching geopolitics at the Air Force Academy, where I would have teams that actually had to take on the persona of a very um, militarized state, or a, um, um, I guess I think it's a militarized, aggressive state. I would give them, you know, create a persona card or character for their, their state that basically used verbiage or narrative that made them sound like we are the great communists, you know, flying our flag and, you know, dying in the streets for the, the homeland or something like that. I'd have the players in the comparative authoritarian class, they had to create personas for themselves. Like, wh who are you on the team and what do you believe based around this ideology? So it made them feel like they had that sense of agency within the constraints. Um, and then I would give, even if it's a competitive game, I mean, I'm sorry, a cooperative game, to have that balanced out to give that sense of risk and certainty the teams will have conflicting goals and the one that's a more like a democratic like a modeled on like britain or norway will have a goal that's more you know what can we do to work together with a militarized state is like what can we do to conquer um to simplify it in a manner a lot of it is just on how the narrative i guess you, the words you choose and how you build that character or that um yeah, I guess you have that character or the player for the game. Great, thank you. Um, I clearly have played a lot of Dominion this past weekend. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we've one from Philip Dursey who said, uh, "Do you uh, 
uh, work in or game economic phenomena like economic warfare uh, in your political gaming? Um, and, um, could you point to re uh, some research on that front? Um, probably as not much as the, the questioner would like. We did, like when I played, did the geopolitics games at the Air Force Academy, there was an economic component, but it was, say, somewhat abstract, like the idea of just having like resources, like you will have this amount of, like this will represent your economy writ large, but not like heavy granular detail. Or the, the game, I, the classroom game I published in uh, Journal of Political Science Education, where I purposely made the economy abstract because the, the game was meant to be played early in the course where they don't necessarily know all the concepts. But then they use chocolate as, as game pieces because then it created that sensory moment where now they start fighting over these pieces and actually eating them in front of me, much to my dismay. Um, but honestly, the answer to the, I, I know exactly what to look for it, though, if I was going to look for uh, games that went into more detail on that. Um, journal simulation and gaming would be a good place. And um, internet, the journal International Studies uh, Perspectives is, uh, at least the last time I looked at it, they're pretty good at probably one, every issue they put out some game for it. And then, um, 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 oh crap, what's the other name of the journal? Perspectives in Political Science. Um, they put out a, I mean, political science focus, but they usually have a section on education, every issue, and a lot of times they'll have a, a classroom game in it. But yeah, if you, um, actually, I said a question I wouldn't mind follow up on an email. If you want to drop me a line, I'd be interested in researching that and helping find games that get at that. That helped me too, build my repertoire. <clears throat> Great. So just for your knowledge, uh, Philip Dursey had asked that. So don't be shocked to be an email from him soon. Um, and then we have one last question uh, from Sebastian, who had asked, uh, when the magic circle is breaking or even completely broken, do you have any advice in reconstitu reconstituting the liminal state? Yes. Uh, do a, um, do a, a, a a, an, a, an after action report or a debrief at that moment. So it's not the it's not the final one, but you basically take the players and do a, okay, let's uh, memorialize the event early, which comes from McKay, the idea of active decompressing and walking back out. So, okay, you've broken the circle. Let's sit down and now talk about it and see where, you know, where we went wrong. And that's a professional uh, standpoint, but I've also seen entertainment games um, where Game Masters and Dungeon Masters might have a, um, actually have a personal conflicts break out in the game where they actually will say, we're going to take a timeout. I'm going to walk away from this table briefly and you're going to talk amongst yourselves and we'll come back. Actually, they might not even come back to the game table. They'll go to another room to maintain the sacredness of the gaming table and say, let's talk about it a little bit. And then when you're ready, you go back and basically either start the game over or just do like a, rec, a short retcon where you pick up, okay, let's back up 20 minutes previously and pick up from there. Okay, so I think that's all the questions we had in the queue. Um, if I missed anyone's in the chat, feel free to blur it out now. That's um, a-okay. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to do a little plug for our uh, upcoming events. Um, uh, so uh, we have in a week and a half on June 18th, uh, a webinar from Jim Dietz on designing for publication. Um, and in so two weeks from today, on, on uh, June 23rd, um, we have uh, uh, Wargaming in NATO and Beyond um, by Natalia, I'm going to butcher this, but we'll Wajawisk. Didn't pronounce that right. I apologize, Natalia. And finally, on June 25th, um, we have Matt Caffrey uh, doing a presentation on key figures in war. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Fielder. Um, really was a great presentation. I appreciate all the questions as well from everyone. Uh, and just a reminder to everyone, um, if you do have any follow-up questions for Dr. Fielder, um, his uh, 
uh, email is should still be on the um, screen. That's james.fielder at colostate.edu. Um, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. I, I really appreciate it, and I uh, hope everyone learned a lot. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for coming out and not burning me in effigy or anything like that after the fact. I think I said everything right, dude. So this is Sebastian from Goose. Thank you for everyone for attending. Um, we will open. Uh, we'll keep this Zoom open for uh, a few minutes longer for anyone who has last minute questions or wants to share stories. Um, I'll share one uh, real quick. Is talking about risk and increasing the connection in even in games. Is that um, during my course I allow my students to wager small amounts of their final grade to play for extra credit. Um, and that introduces a huge element of risk for my students to the point that they become incredibly invested in the games they play for extra credit um, because they don't want to lose something because there's actually a tangible uh, risk for something they understand, which is their grade. Um, I, so I wanted to ask James if he had any other experiences like that. Okay, so yeah, the, on the one hand, what I found in class is I generally discourage educators from making the game itself gradable um, because that can have a humongous chilling effect on the players, or at least not a significant portion of, the, of their grade. What you make gradable is like an after-action report where they had to write a reflection essay. Like, yes, my team lost. No, I'm not going to fail the class because of that. However, I'm going to talk about here why we chose a strategy we did and why um, we, uh, <clears throat> why we likely failed in it. And now I do, now the idea of like, if you, you'd be amazed at like what people will, con like if they see there's some sort of prize. And I've, you know, talking to my students about this in both USAFA and CSU, they say that if you give us something that tangible to, to, to fight over, um, we'll put a lot of effort into it. So even, Okay, the idea of like giving like five extra credit points, 10 extra credit points, is that going to sink or swim everyone's grade? No. But for some students, that could be a very, very powerful motivator. Um, yes, it could be extrinsic, but like, hey, I want to do well in this class. I have a benefit from picking up here. Um, other than that, you also could use like other um, tangible prizes, like with the, the game I did in class using chocolate pieces. Did they get graded on their performance in the game? No, but did they get to keep the chocolate at the end of the game? Yes. And for a bunch of uh, highly active cadets, 18 to 21 years old, they were like, yeah, we're gonna take all this chocolate with you. And they were actually, it became something that they were fighting over and hoarding. Cause like, I want to keep my heart Hershey's Kisses. Yeah. Very amusing to watch you know, from my perspective. I want to pop in real quick and say that it has been an honor and a pleasure to meet and get to work with Dr. Fielder, aka Pigeon. He has shown me that my work apparently has some meaning in this space, and that has been an amazing eye-opener for me. One of the things I really want to reemphasize is that, yes, we together, along with an amazing team, both here in Denver, uh, in the greater Colorado area, greater Denver area, as well as across the nation, are putting together an amazing team to bring some 21st century ideas to both the professional and entertainment gaming spaces when the academic spaces and things like that. So if you're interested in finding out more about uh, what we're up to, check out Liminal Operations. We're gonna be moving into a think tank type of uh, space. We'll definitely be looking for other people to work with. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm doing a, a blatant plug here, but we're really excited about the fun stuff that we're gonna be doing in this space. And I just wanna say I'm, I'm excited to be working with Pigeon on that. Thank you. Thank you. Pardon me while I blush. So uh, if there are no more questions from the group, um, I'll hold this line open for everyone to exit and then I'll close it out. Thank you, James, again with, uh, for presenting uh, such a great presentation. Thank you for everyone for participating and engaging.